Welcome to Hyde Park, Bethlehem United Methodist Church. And we're so glad you're here. My name is Diane Richardson. I will be your liturgist this morning. So if you're able, please stand and join with me in the call to worship. As members of Christ's tree of life, we are connected in love to God. As members of Christ's tree of life, we are connected in love to one another. And as members of Christ's tree of life, we are strengthening our connection through worship and grace. Let us pray. Loving God, send your spirit among us now. Bind us to you in love this day that we may worship in unity and friendship. Bind us to your love this hour, that we may be strengthened to bring abundant love to your world. In love and gratitude, we pray. Amen. Your squishies on a field trip and they 
Our scripture reading for today comes from 1 John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Hear now God's word. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but, he, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this time, by this we know that we abide in him and that he in us, because he has given us his spirit, and we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out our fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. O oh God, speak truth into our hearts, and speak love into our lives, that we may remain in your love, and that we may share your love joyously with others. Speak grace into our souls, that we may rest in your grace, and forgive others as we have been forgiven. Speak mercy into our world, that all the world may know your love, and find redemption through your grace. Amen. Did you happen to notice how many times that John used one word, love, in the scripture that I just read? 29 times. 29 times. And when a word is used that many times, friends, we need to sit up and take notice. Let me ask you a question. Do you know the love of God? Do you realize how much God loves you? Do you know what a difference that makes in your life and in the lives of those around you? Maybe people you don't even know, as a matter of fact. You might ask yourself, well, exactly what kind of love is that? And scripture tells us in 1 John 4.10, it says, This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then it goes on to say in verse 19, we love because he first 
loved us. I don't know how it was growing up in your house, but I knew that my parents loved me. I knew it without a shadow of a doubt. And how did I know that? Because my parents were always asking me to do something that shared myself with somebody else. Can you help open that door? Can you go back and do the barn work? Can you help me do this or that? Hmm. What are we sharing with one another? So what's so special about these two verses? They both show an initiative on God's part. Who loved first? God. God loved first. And when we really take a look at the initiative that God takes loving you and me, he doesn't just sit back and leave us alone to figure out our problems or to say, hey, tap us on the shoulder, but he takes the initiative. I want to give you a few examples. You remember in the Old Testament when Noah, when, the, when the, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and God said to Noah, I want you to build an ark. Who took the initiative? God. And when we think about the covenant between Abraham and God that grew into a covenant with the whole country of Israel, all the people there, God took the initiative. And then God led Israel out of slavery in Egypt. Who took the initiative? Once again, it was God. And then we think about Moses and the burning bush. Who took the initiative? Again, it was God. And once we start to realize this pattern in the Old Testament of God initiating and taking an active role, because God does take an active role in your life, we can see that it doesn't stop there. We keep flipping through the pages and reading more and more in our Bibles, and we see God's active role. It continues and it moves towards the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So how is God's love displayed through Jesus Christ? When we think about God taking an active role in our lives, we're able to appreciate how God displays his love through Jesus. In 1 John 4, 9 and 10, I want you to listen to these words. He says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So how was it that God's love was displayed and has been made known to you and me? Through the death of Jesus. And in return, life has been given to us. His atoning death has led to the forgiveness of our sins. And not just because we sin and say, oh well. Because we recognize that we have sinned. We've sinned against each other and we've sinned against God. But what makes that love so grand is almost baffling. It's that God is not obligated to send us Jesus so that our sins can be forgiven. He doesn't have to do that for us. But you see, God is a God of love. So he does. He does it out of love. God is the source of our love. It is the fountain from which love flows. God modeled love so that we can see what love looks like by seeing how God treats us. Secondly, Jesus modeled love by living among us. 
and dying to save us. Thirdly, God loves our brothers and sisters. And how can we claim to love God if we despise those whom God loves? Don't we break God's heart when we do not love those that God loves? God's purpose in sending his son, Jesus Christ, into the world is that we might live right now. We can't help what's happened in the past, but you can start right now and live. Friends, life is worth living. Longevity can be part of the blessing that we receive as believers, but it can also mean that God had something more like eternal life in mind. A blessed life. Meaning, regardless of our physical circumstances, we can be content and know that we are loved. You see, our faith assures us that God is both with us in life and in death. That assurance surely reduces our anxiety, and our faith helps us to avoid self-destructive behaviors. God's love transforms us. In verse 11 it states, if God loved us in this way, we also ought to love one another. Friends, we've received unselfish love from God. And God wants you and I to give unselfish love to one another. That doesn't mean that we don't have boundaries. It doesn't mean that we're enablers. I've had to learn all that. We all learn it. But God's love should transform us. I want you to listen to these scripture passages. In 1 John 4, 8, it says, Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Then in 1 John 4, 11 and 12, it says, Dear friends, since God so loves us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. And this is how love is made complete among us so that we have confidence, not fear, but confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus because perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. God's love. Whoever claims to love God yet hates brother or sister is a liar, for whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. You see, God's love's not passive. It's active. It drives, it transforms, it changes us. It drives us to love one another and help us to understand that God was willing to take the initiative because we're loved. You see, if Jesus struggled, and ask God to take this cup from him. He knows that we struggle too. But surely you and I can find a way to love. Is God's love a driving force in your life? I want to know how God's love has transformed you and changed you. Is it? When we love God with all our heart and soul and all of our mind, we have a relationship that's transformed.
for me. And when we love each other with a selfless love, we find that we have a heart and a soul that is unified with God. God's love takes root into our very being. And you see this reciprocal action begins to happen. I love to read the Apostle Paul's writing because he talks about this mutuality of love and what it brings to the table. A reciprocal reaction, a perpetual motion. We love our brothers and sisters in Christ and they love us because we found a home. When John says that God is love, he is saying that love is embedded in us because love is God's nature. And we can depend on God to love us, even when we're unlovable. When something is our nature, it's relatively unchangeable. For example, the color of my eyes. Yes, I could put different color contacts in and change my eye color, but I can't really change my eye color. What about my IQ? I can study diligently and I can improve my competency, but I don't think I'm ever gonna really be a genius. It's not going to happen. Some people, as we go through life, struggle with different genetic factors. It's a challenge for them. It's embedded in them. But when John says God is love, I want you to believe him because it is God's nature. It's unchangeable. We might think of God as the ocean in which God abides. When we abide in that ocean of love, we have this deep and abiding relationship. We can feel the movement of the waves. We can hear and smell and taste the salt water. Can we not? We can be confident that we are swimming in God's ocean of love. And we can also be assured that we have solid ground to stand on. Do you ever dip your foot in? And you just want to see how far down you can go before you can touch solid ground. You dive into a pool. Can I touch the bottom? Be assured that God is not only love, but God is a solid ground on which you can stand. John talks about perfect love casting out fear. In this love, it has been made perfect among us that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, even so are we in this world, John says. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out our fear because fear has to do with punishment. He who fears is not made perfect in love. The day of judgment will come for all of us, for me, for you, for all. And it's frightening for many people. Jesus portrays that day in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, where he sits on a throne surrounded by angels with all the nations assembled before him. And he says that he will separate the sheep from the goats, directing the sheep to his right, the favored hand, and the goats to his left hand, his disfavored hand. Then he will bless the sheep and pronounce a curse on the goats. And the difference will be between the blessed and the cursed and the way that they have treated the vulnerable people in their midst. You know, those hungry people, the people who are thirsty, not just physically, but spiritually. The strangers, the naked, the people who are exposed, the sick, the prisoners, it's no wonder that people have fear about how they will be judged. 
Will he embrace you or will he reject you? Will he curse or will he bless? Everything hangs in the balance. That moment when our eternal destination will be determined. What John has to say in these verses coincides with what Jesus said in Matthew 25. When we abide in love, we have that same loving nature as God. We remain in God and God remains in us. Therefore, here's the good news. We can approach the throne on the day of judgment knowing that God loves us and has made provisions throughout eternity for you and me. For all of us. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Remember what I just said? You can't do anything about the past, but you can do something today, and you can continue that tomorrow. This verse states the other side of the coin. Love makes us bold and confident. It also casts out fear. What are you afraid of? Is John talking about our love for God or God's love for us? I'm certain it's the former. I'm certain it's about God's love for us. And how our love for God is rooted in our faith. That faith that says God loves me, God loves you. And if we can accept that, everything else will fall into place. With a better understanding of how God's nature is, because it's love, and how God takes the initiative to love us, so much so that he sent Jesus Christ to live among us and die for us, don't we need to ask how we can initiate that love in our own lives? What does it look like to take an initiative to love? What about loving someone who's defiant or in the middle of a mental health crisis? What about family members who have different political views? Maybe it can be as simple as listening to someone who needs forgiveness. Regardless, we do not love because it is something that we have to do, or because we're obligated, or because we just feel the need to. You see, God's love needs to be embedded as part of who we are. It drives us to love someone else. If we follow Jesus, we serve a God who decided to take an initiative in giving us Jesus as the example. And we should be changed and transformed and take the initiative to love like we have been loved. Our love for God is our response to God's love for us. Isn't it time? We not only know, but we display that love of God to others. Amen. Receive now the benediction. Let, love, let God's love transform you in your life and in the world. Amen.